The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let's get on with today's lecture. And I want to look at a variety of different problems, different different uh, classes of problems. We're going to look at four different classes of problems and talk about the way you to go about approaching them. We need very few fundamental laws. We're going to use, we use the same fundamental laws again and again. And the issue is really how do you go about applying them? One is the sum, this fundamental laws for rigid bodies. So the fundamental laws that are always true, the sum of the external forces, vectors, Time rate of change of the momentum of the system with respect to an inertial frame. And we know that to, you know, we recognize as mass times acceleration. Newton's second law. The other one is the summation of external torques. And that one is the time derivative of angular momentum with respect to a point, which you choose, this is an A, plus the velocity of A with respect to the inertial frame cross with the momentum with respect to the inertial frame. So that's the torque equation. Now we have two special cases of this where the second term goes away. One is when you are at the center of gravity, in which case, by definition, the velocity of that point and the momentum are in the same direction. The cross product disappears. So we, there's two special cases we use all the time when it simplifies to that. One is when you're at the center of gravity. The other is when, for whatever reason, this velocity is parallel to that and the cross product goes to zero. And sometimes the velocity is just plain zero. So lots, there's some certain cases that we use lots of times when that term goes away, but sometimes it doesn't, and you just have to put up, put up with it. So those are our two fundamental laws, and the question really is how to go about applying them. So I'm going to look at four, four classes of problems. I'll sort of name them right now. Pure. And I'll do simplest to hardest. Pure rotation about a fixed axis through G, through the center of mass. Pretty trivial. We can all do those kind of problems. A second class, pure rotation. about fixed axis at A, which is not equal to G. You're not at the center of mass. Again, pretty simple problems. Third class, no external. I'll call it no external constraints. Um, we'll have to look at you an example to see what I really mean. I will, I'll, I'll give you an example right now, which we'll do. You have this hockey puck with a string attached to it, force, and this whole thing is on 
on, on a frictionless surface. So it's constrained so it can't go through the surface. But so no external constraints in the direction that the motion can happen. So this is a 2D problem, can move in the x, y, and rotation. But it's not touching. There's no con things constraining it in the, in the directions of movement which are allowed in the problem. That's just too much words to write up here. So this kind of problem. And the fourth are problems with moving points of constraint. Now, the, you, you won't see a textbook with sections broken out like this. I'm using my own terminology. I just made it up last night as I was finishing off the lecture. But so you, this is just give, I'm trying to give you some insight. And this is the way I think about these things. So let's quickly go through examples from the first couple of types because they're especially easy. So what are we saying there? Pure rotation about a fixed axis through G. Okay, Center of mass is somewhere along this axle. The axle is fixed. This object can spin around it. And these kind of problems are particularly simple, so I'm not going to dwell on them. But here's class one. One, class one problems. And it's basically, the, these are rotors, typically rotors you know, of almost all kinds. So um, for these problems, you use momentum, angular momentum, with respect to the center of mass. <clears throat> you can express it as Ig times omega x, omega y, omega z. All these problems can be expressed with a moment of inertia matrix times the rotation vector. And it'll give you hx, hy, hz. And you can use that second <coughs> formula up there, the torques, or dh, dt. So it's through, fixed through g, so the second term doesn't appear. So to do these problems, the sum of the, see, I'll just give an example here for 2D planar motion, they get especially simple. Then for 2D planar motion, that means omega here is 0, 0, and we'll let Z be the rotation axis, and this h then, with respect to g, just becomes i, z, z, omega, z. Those are the, all those 2D planar motion problems boil down to this. And d, h, g, d, t then is i, z, z, with respect to g, omega z dot, or more familiar notation. Okay. So all those planar motion problems passing through axis, passing through g, like this. Does, um, for those problems, does this matrix have to be with respect to principal <coughs> axes. You have in your, your XYZ coordinate system. To do, these, to do this style of problem, does that actually have to be expressed in principal coordinates so that it's diagonal? 
It doesn't have to be. This, this, you're worried about rotation about z. You'll find that that statement's still always true. Now, there may be, if the thing could definitely have imbalances and have unusual other torques, that will fall out in the problem. But the, for the motion around the axis of spin, this and where, where you only have a one omega z component, just the one component, you will get, it'll work out just fine. Yeah? Some kind of IXD and IYZ terms, you would, you would end up with more. You'll end up with, you will end up with, first of all, if you have a off diagonal Z terms, XZ, YZ terms, when you multiply that out, you will find components of H that are in directions in the Z direction as well as perhaps in the X and Y. And those off, those other two components, tell you that H is not pointing in the same direction as omega, right? And that it tells you instantly that the thing is dynamically unbalanced and will have other torques that are trying to bend that axle, right? So they will, they'll always appear. All right. Let's move on. I want to make sure we get through this today. Class two problems. These are basically, these are the pure rotation around some point that's not through G. And um, for, th again though, this is a fixed, the key here is fixed axis at A. It's not moving. This is what makes these problems simpler. For these kinds of problems, you do the sum of the torques with respect to A, the external torques. And because that point's fixed, the second terms don't appear, the V cross P terms. And you can write these as I, a moment of inertia matrix, times whatever the rotations are. In, in, you, in order to define the mass moment of inertia matrix, you must have chosen a set of coordinates attached to the body, right? And then with those coordinates, you've computed the moments of inertia for the body. And if you chose wisely, you get principal coordinates and you only get diagonal entries on the matrix. If you chose unwisely, you will get other stuff. But it's still a valid mass moment of inertia matrix. It just gives rise, you have to deal with a bunch of other terms. So this will still yield the same answer. Uh, how do you get I with respect to A? This is a, these are opportunities when you can use parallel axis. Yeah? Um, isn't I omega just H dot DHCT? Uh, I this. Excuse me. We need to, you need to have finished that out. This is I, this is H. So the time derivative of H is the time derivative of this expression. You have to figure out the moments of inertia and the rotation rates, and you may get multiple terms. Only one of which, let's say that, uh, This will work out. You will get multiple terms. You will get um, torques that are not in the direction of spin. Against these, could be these might be unbalanced. On the other hand, it may be uh, for 2D problems, which is common. So for the 2D planar motion, which most of the problems we do are then what, you're, what you would do is you're saying omega is, say, 0, 0, omega z, which simplifies that, multiplying this thing out quite a lot. And if uh, 
I with respect to G is diagonal, then that means you chose your G, you chose principal axes, right? Then, but then how do you get to I with respect to A? For 2D problems, you know, really simple ones, how do you get to I with respect to A? That's when you, it's the classic case for using the parallel axis theorem. So for these 2D planar motion problems, and it, uh, the planar motion problems, then you can use parallel axis. Okay. And we're going to do, I'll do an example. So this is kind of the setup for this. Um, an example of this on the homework. What problem on the homework is just perfect for this? It's 2D planar motion about a fixed point. Yeah, the, the cylinder, this is the uh, disc with the square cutout with a pin at the top turning it into a pendulum. That's the fixed point. You can figure this out. You can use parallel axis. And we're going to do an example right now that's almost identical to that problem. And we started it last time. So this, the example I want to work is very similar. It's basically this problem, is that pendulum. Okay. So let's just work it through quickly. We had done the setup last, uh, last time. <clears throat> so last time I basically had derived uh, an example of the parallel axis theorem for my little stick here. And I'll give you the, some geometry, some values. So here's G. Here's the point I want it to rotate about, A. The distance between these two points is D. It's going to pop up in my parallel axis theorem. The, I've got a set of coordinates here. My G is, of course, in the center of this thing, the geometric center. So I have a, a body fixed set of axes, which I'm going to call Z. And my X is in this direction. So that would make my Y going into the board. So the Y is like kind of like that, OK? And this has some properties. The dimension in this direction is A. The direction in this dimension is B. So it's a, got a width A, a thickness B, and a length L. So when you compute, these are, ah, symmetry now. So if the axes that I've chosen for this problem, are they principal axes? All right, the perpend there's three, three planes of symmetry in this problem, and I've got one, per, one principal axis perpendicular to every one of them, and all three pass through the center of mass, and they're orthogonal to one another. So those are conditions are all satisfied for these to be principal axes for this rectangular body, okay, and its uniform density. So I'll give you the, for bodies like this in your book or any book on dynamics, you can look up then the properties, the uh, I, Z, Z, and we're going to spin this thing, this thing we're going to have it uh, rotating about, which one I'm going to use? Yeah, around the z-axis That's how I'll set it up. So it's, that's the way I've drilled my holes. So it's going back and forth. So the, the wide part of it's this way. So I, z, z with respect to g, m 
L squared plus A squared over 12. I, Y, Y. Okay, now just to make a point, the uh, dimensions L, 32.1 centimeters, A, 4.71, B, 1.25, and eventually my D, this offset, I'll be, uh, for example, where I've drilled that hole, is at 10.2. The point I want to make here, lots of times we could, we, it'd be nice if I could just make the simplification to call this a slender rod, be able to ignore these A and B dimensions in this just to get quick answers. Do you think that's slender enough? So it's about, it's not even 10 times, the length of width here isn't even 10, it's probably six or seven, okay? So the key issue, then, if you look at this, is really what's the ratio of A squared to L squared? That would tell you something about the rel relative importance of the A squared term to the L squared. So let me tell you about that. So A squared over L squared is 0 0.022. B squared over L squared is 0 0.002. So even with this kind of fat stick, the approximation of ML squared over 12 is pretty good. It's only 2% off. And this approximation, L squared over 12, is less than 2 tenths of a percent off. So we often, for roughly slender things, we oftentimes just say ML squared over 12 for a spin about their center. OK. The, um, we now need to apply parallel axis. I want to spin this around, let this rotate around, not around G, but now around the point off to the side. So we worked out last time that I, ZZ with respect to A, is I, ZZ, G plus MD squared. Okay. <coughs> So in, this, so in this particular problem, I, this IZZ about G is approximately ML squared over 12. So just by way of example to see what we might uh, find out here is let's let D equal L over 2. That would be if I move this, want to put my hole right at the very top, how would this thing behave? I don't have a hole right at the top, but I have one close, OK? So let's just, just because the numbers are easy to work. What happens if you put in L over 2 into this formula? Well, then I, Z, Z, A is ML squared over 12 plus M, L over 2 squared is L squared over 4. And that's ML squared over 3, which is a number you'll run into again and again and again in mechanical engineering, because examples like this are used a lot. The mass, moment of inertia, about a slender rod pinned at its end, ML squared over 3. Okay. So let's take this problem to a little more towards completion. The sum of the external moments with respect to A, dH, A, dT. And that's going to be 
d by dt in this problem. The only rotation <coughs> is omega z. So this is going to be i z z with respect to a <coughs> omega z. Okay, and that just gives us i z z a omega z dot or our familiar i z z a theta double dot if you want. And we'll make, here's now our, here's our problem. It simplifies to this slender rod and <clears throat> let me do the more general case. Here's my rod. The pivot point that it's going around is here. Here's, this is D still, and this is G, and it's swinging with respect to this point, so here's the angle theta. So it swings about this point that you've fixed, and that point is D above the, the center of gravity, center of mass. So what are the external moments about this point? There's no torque right at the point, but a free body diagram of this, of drawing this as a, uh, here's a point of rotation. Here it is displaced through an angle theta. The weight of the object can all be concentrated, thought of for the purposes of the free body diagram is acting through G. So here's the mass at G, gravity acting down on it, and the length of this arm here that is about which it's swinging is D. So the torque about this is, and it's pulling it back, minus M G D sine theta. Probably you've seen that many times before, including the recent homework. And that must be equal to IZZ about A theta double dot. So we have an, we have an equation of motion. Just collecting the terms together. So this is a oscillator that for this problem has no external excitation. This is its equation of motion. And I need a theta double dot. Okay, but is it linear? Is it linear? No, it's not a linear equation of motion. But for sure it is an oscillator. Right? And for anything that vibrates, you can have lots of nonlinear problems that, that exhibit vibration. They, you can think of them, you can pose problems where you say, okay, what's their static equilibrium position? And think of a very small motion about that static equilibrium position. You can always linearize about the static equilibrium position and be able to come up with a linearized equation of motion that at least from that you can calculate the natural frequency of the system for small motions around its linear, around its static equilibrium position. So in this case, that's pretty easy to do, and you've seen it before for small theta. Sine theta is approximately equal to theta, so we are going to linearize the equation. This theta equals zero is the static equilibrium position. So we're linearizing around zero, and around zero, that's the approximation. So you just substitute that in, IZZA, theta double dot plus MGD theta equals zero. There's your linearized equation of motion. I want an estimate of the natural frequency. So you know, find omega n. So this is basically entering into solving differential equations, but I let Mother Nature tell me what the answer is. I do the, I do the example, and I say it oscillates. Looks a lot like sine omega t to me, right? 
Plug in sine omega t. Let's find out. Some theta amplitude sine omega t. Plug it in. So you plug that in here. And you get minus omega squared izz a plus mgd. And all of this, you can factor out the theta 0, sine omega t equals 0. That's what you get. And general theta, that's not 0, else you'd have a trivial problem, not moving at all. But in order for this equation, and this can be any, anything between 0, minus 1, and plus 1, depending on the time. So in order to satisfy this equation, this part inside of the parentheses has to be 0. And when you just solve that, you find that omega squared equals <coughs> mgd over izza. And the reason I've gone to the you know, bother of working this out in detail right to the end is that every one degree of freedom rotational oscillator that you will ever encounter sticks uh, wheels with static imbalances. Let me show you this one. It's an oscillator, too. Any one degree of freedom oscillator, rotational oscillator, pendulum, basically all pendula, this is the formula for the natural frequency. So it's going to be of that form for any pendulum. So any one DOF pendulum, this is the generic answer. So that cutout problem for today has to come down to this, where this is the distance between the mass center and the point of rotation. And that's your mass moment inertia about the point of rotation. So it's worth kind of knowing that one. OK, keep moving. Now things begin to get interesting. The, uh, these latter two classes are, are harder conceptually, but once you have a solution method for them, they're not all that hard. This one is one of the problem I described at the beginning. We've got this hockey puck-like thing and a string wrapped around it pulling on it with a known force. In this problem, they call it 150 newtons. The mass of this thing is 75 kilograms. The, um, it's on a frictionless surface. Okay. And we want to find its acceleration of the center of mass and the rotation of the center of ma uh, around the center of mass. So find theta double dot and find the linear acceleration. That's basically the name of the problem. And they give you that it's 75 kilograms, 150 newtons, and kappa, the radius of gyration, is 0 0.15 meters. This is defined as the radius of gyration. So what's, what's that? So radius of gyration is really appropriate, really only useful about uh, for mostly 2D rotational problems around, one ax around an axis of rotation. And what it means is this is the distance away 
from the center of rotation at which you could concentrate all of the mass and have the same mass moment of inertia. Okay. So this, this has, here's G here at the center, uniform disk. Um, we know that there is an I, Z, Z about G for this problem. And I need to pick a coordinate system so we can talk about things here. Get M out of the center. So I'm going to let Z be upwards. And because I'm looking ahead and want to keep the equation simple, I'm going to make my x-axis here parallel to F, so I only have to deal with one vector, vector component equation. And then that makes the uh, y-axis this way. Okay. So I'm interested in IZZ because I'm spinning around the z-axis. Uh, I know that for a uniform disk, that's a principal axis, is the vertical one. And what I'm saying is that you can then set, find, there's an IZZ of G that is, can be expressed as M kappa squared. So kappa, in effect, is just IZZ G over M square root. Now, why do we use that kind of thing? Well. The, uh, the way this problem was set up, <coughs> I actually took it out of a book. It, was, it wasn't a uniform disk. You know, it's, a, it's a pulley wheel or something, and it's got spokes in here and a rim. It's still axially, some, it still has some axial symmetries, but it's getting a little messy. It's hard for you. You can't just say it's mr squared over 2. It's got some other mass moment of inertia about the center, but it's got holes and, st and stuff in it because of the spokes. So oftentimes, you'll be given the, ma the radius of gyration because it's a little difficult to give you a mathematical description of what the actual IZZ is. That's often why you do it. And the thing is, you can measure. Rather than try to calculate, you can actually just measure the mass moment of inertia of something. So how would I measure? Like I say, I didn't know any formulas, but how would I measure the mass moment of inertia of this in the z direction? What experiment would you do? She says, apply a torque, measure the angular acceleration. Hang a weight off of it, known weight, wrap a string around it. Known mass, known g, known torque around the center. Measure the angular acceleration. I theta double dot equals the torque. You know the torque. You know the measure the theta double dot. Calculate I. I equals m kappa squared. And you could just say, well, kappa for this system is. Okay, that's, that's how you use it. I'll give you a very common example. Really hard to calculate mass moment inertia. A marine propeller. You actually do want to know the mass moment inertia about its center for purposes of torsional oscillations on the shaft, et cetera. Hard to calculate. Pretty easy to measure. OK. So how many degrees of freedom does this problem have? Well, when we say it's 2D, it's a rigid body, but it's 2D, which means it's lying on a plane. It's a planar motion problem, only allowed to rotate in Z, not allowed to rotate in around the x-axis or the y-axis. So there's two, there, for a rigid body, six degrees of freedom possible. There's two immediately that you said it can't rotate, so we're down to four. It uh, cannot, tr cannot translate in the z direction, right? We're down to three, okay? So that leaves us what? So the d degrees of freedom for this problem is 6 minus 3 constraints is 3. That means we have to have three equations of motion. And they would account for mo what are the possible, in other words, saying this, what are the possible motions now of this problem? X, Y, and Z, or rotation in Z. Okay.
So now to, we've set the problem up. Now to go about solving it, we need, uh, let's do, we need a free body diagram. So here's my disk, here's the force. Any other, and there certainly has weight in the z direction, but we're not, there's no z acceleration. So in the plane of the board, that's the only external forces acting on this, right? OK, and there's our G. Now this problem, and I'll say generalize on this in a few minutes, this problem can be always be restated as recast, let me put it that way, as here's your point G with a force acting on the center of mass. See, this force doesn't go through the center of mass. This force goes through the center of mass. I'm going to replace that problem with this problem, a pure moment acting about the center of mass. Problems that you can always make this transition, and I'll do the general case for you in just a minute. But you can always do this. So that's kind of my second point here. Third point. We need then, this is our free body diagram. We need our, uh, apply our laws of motion. So some of the forces in the Y are, and now remember this is Z coming out of the board, Y this way, X this way. Some of the forces in the Y, zero, M acceleration, of g in the y direction, 0. So you know there's no acceleration in the y. So we've solved. It has three degrees of freedom. That's the first equation of motion. Give you a trivial result. So y double dot is 0. That's your first equation of motion. Then you have a second equation of motion. Sum of the forces in the x direction equals just our f i hat positive x direction, because we were clever in how we set up the coordinate system. And that's got to be m x double dot i hat direction. So we know right away that x double dot is the force f divided by m. And that's 150 newtons over 75 kilograms, or 2 meters per second squared. All right. The third one, then, is the uh, moment of inertia with respect to g in this problem. The, um, excuse me, the angular momentum is some izz g times omega z. And that's what we're looking for. So this is another way of izz g theta dot k hat direction. And we're going to apply that the external torques, sum of the torques, is dh with respect to g dt. And that's going to give us izz g theta double dot. So this third class of problems, you are best just working with respect to the center of mass. That's kind of the point here. There's no, there's no, there's not no con points of contact. There's just known external forces. You have to deal with them. Do your work with respect to the center of mass. So we have force equations. We have moment equations, and basically you're. You know, you, you know IZZ for this problem is kappa squared M, and you're given M, and you're given kappa. So you can now, and what we have to, oh, actually the last thing left here is to figure out the torque. What's the torque? Well, it's R in this direction crossed with F in that direction. So it's RJ crossed with FI, J cross I. Minus, right, RF minus RFK hat. So you can now solve for theta double dot as 
RF over IZZ. Or RF over M kappa squared. And that says, minus says it's rotating this way, which is what you'd expect, right? Now, I meant to ask you a question before we started, but to, to think about this. If I had right at the beginning and said, OK, this is a problem. If I grab this string and pull in this direction, will there be any motion in the y direction? If I, I meant to start that way. I'm really kicking myself for not doing that. Because a lot of people think that there's possible that it can move off in the y direction because it's not being loaded symmetrically. You're pulling on a side. Some people think it'll kind of try to move away like that. It doesn't, does it? OK. So an important generalization, you've got a rigid body. You have a force acting on it. It has a mass center here. So perpendicular to that force is some distance, OK? We'll call it D. You can always equate this problem to and set it up as force. Conceptually, you can think of it as equal and opposite forces, which cancel one another. So it's like I've done nothing to this problem. And then a force acting at this distance, f. This is our distance, d. So this problem is identical to that problem. I've just added and taken away two more forces, right? So the, the total forces on the system are still F. And there's still an F operating at a, at a lever arm D. But now, if I put these two together, they are equal and opposite, and they form a couple, a moment, acting like that. So this is equivalent to, here's G with an F on it and a moment m naught, OK? And this m naught is my d cross f. So that's the generalization for what I did up here. I, may, I went from that to that. And this is why you can do that, OK? And so there's a, if there's a gen, now if you have an object and lots of different forces acting on it, and this is Fi down here, and here's G. And you can draw a radius from G to this point, so I'll call that Ri with respect to G. Then the way to generalize this is that this is equal to um, some F total and a moment acting at G. Okay. And all that you have to do there is F total is the summation of the FIs, vector sum. And the MG, the M with respect to G here, is the summation of the R, I with respect to G, cross FI. So that's the, gen that's the generalization for multiple forces on a body. So you are making an equivalent force acting at G and a moment acting at G. And I shouldn't call this little g. That's really confusing. So that's the generalization when you need to do problems like this. OK.
catch your breath while I scrub a board here. Now we've got to move on to these class, the, this class four problems. Moving points. An example is that truck problem that you had. Known acceleration. <clears throat> so there's two common ways of doing this problem. You can do this problem by summing forces at the center of mass of that pipe and summing moments around it. But the moment around this comes from a friction force here, which you don't know. So that introduces an unknown that you have to then solve for. So if you work around G for this pipe, you can do it. You can work around G. You can say some of the moments around G, some of the forces expected to G, but you have to deal with unknown forces. So we're working with respect to G implies unknown forces, e, e, for example, friction. So you'd really maybe rather work around the point of contact, A, because if you sum your moments about A, the friction force has no moment arm and you don't, it doesn't appear in the answer, right? So, but this gets trickier. This is a, this is a little more um, sophisticated, I'll just call it, step. And you need, to do this, you need a little theorem. So, to work with respect to A, you need to be able to say that the angular momentum with respect to A, it's, you now are working around a moving point, maybe accelerating. It's very handy to be able to say it's the angular momentum around G, which is easier to calculate, plus R G A, the distance from the center of mass to the point you're working on, cross the linear momentum of the system with respect to the inertial frame. We need this, so this is a formula we need. And let's see why this is true. I think this is the sort of thing, you know, that's, this is a formula that has come out of the blue here. And why is it true? So I don't usually like to do proofs, but the proofs of this in a, on the board. But the proof of this is really quite simple. Here's a little mass point, mi. And this radius is r of i with respect to a. This is r of g with respect to a. And therefore, this is R of I with respect to G is this one. And we know that this plus this gives us that. So we can say R I, particle I with respect to A is R G with respect to A plus R I with respect to G, all vectors. So the angular momentum of that body uh, we, is from the basic definition of angular momentum is the summation of all the little mass bits of the ri with respect to a cross the linear momentum of each little mass bit. Okay. 
but we can expand that with that sum. So this is the summation of my R G with respect to A plus R I with respect to G cross P I O. Summation over all the mass bits. I'm going to expand this. And I can expand this into this times that, summations of this times that and this times that. So that becomes a R G A cross summation of, of what's PIO? This is a little mi's. V i with respect to O. Each one has a velocity, each one has a mass. So this is mi v i with respect to O plus the summation r i g's cross mi v i o's. Now, notice I pulled this one outside of the summation. That's because this is a single, this is a fixed number. It doesn't change in the summation. It's just the distance from my starting point to g. So I can pull it out and do the summation and then do the cross product. <clears throat> what is the summation of all the MVIs for the body? That's the momentum of each little particle. Add them all up, what do you get? So this is R, G, A, cross, P with respect to O. That's this term. And this is all the little distances from the center of mass to the cross with the momentum of each little one. What's that? Well, this, is a, this looks like a definition of angular momentum. This is the angular momentum of the, every little mass particle with respect to g. Add it up. This is h with respect to g, which is what we set out to prove. So the h with respect to a is h with respect to g plus rga across the linear momentum of the body. Yeah? Um, can you also do this by writing pi with respect to o, I mean, the velocity part of that as the sum of the velocities? Mm, you got to keep the m in there. Oh, well, yeah, with that. But instead of writing out r as a sum, you can write out the velocity as the um, sum of the velocity with respect to the origin. Mm. Are you talking about this term here? No, I'm um, h, the definition of um, angular momentum. Yeah. The velocity. If you can figure out, if you had the angular momentum of these little peaks and multiplied by RIA, that's, that is the angular momentum with respect to A. Okay. But I broke it apart so that I could show you that this formula I want to use has two pieces. Oh, okay. I want to use that, okay? So that uh, if I can use that, see, it's easy to get H with respect to G sometimes. It's really hard to know what to do around this, with things that happen around this point A. So now let's go back. Let's, I think to understand this, we need to go back to our truck problem. We now have a formula that you know where it comes from. We have our truck that is accelerating at x1 double dot. And we want to find out what the what state of double dot for that uh, pipe. What's it doing? So first, we needed some kinematics. And in particular, what is the x2? I, I label this very well. I didn't. So here's my pipe. Here's my truck bed that it's in contact with. Trucks moving at x1 double dot, we know. The, in an inertial frame, the movement of the center of mass of my pipe is x2. and it has some angular rotation rate, I'll call, or angular rotation, I'll call theta. So 
the movement of this guy, I need to be able to express in terms of x1 and theta. Well, if this is fixed to the truck, and you just, the truck moved forward, then x2 would be equal to x1. But in fact, it rolls back a little bit. And the distance this point moves if it rolls through an angle theta is it rolls backwards an amount r theta. And we're going to need to take two derivatives of that, x2 double dot equals x1 double dot minus r theta double dot. Okay. So that's the little kinematic relationship we need to do this problem. Next, we apply, need to apply a physical law, which is the one I've derived. So this is our physics here now, our physical law. And that's that the external torques, dH with respect to A, dT, plus VAO cross PO. And in this case, is there, is this non, is VAO zero? No, in fact, it's x1 dot, right? It's in the i direction. How about, what direction is P, the momentum of the pipe? Does it move in the y direction? Up, down, no, it only moves in the x. So this velocity, is only in the x. This is in the x, or the i-hat direction. This cross product is 0. So it just happens that they're parallel, so this thing goes to 0. You don't have to deal with it. That's because these guys are parallel. Parallel motion. But you did have to consider it. You did have to think about it. It's not just trivially 0. OK, so that means that the torques about a is just dh, a, d, t. And <clears throat> HA for this problem is I, well, it's HG, which is IZZ G theta double dot. But I have to put in this uh, theta dot, excuse me. This is just the H. I have to put in the second term, RG with respect to A cross P with respect to O. So here's my HA. I'll to write it again up here. This is IZZG, theta, double dot, theta dot in the K. And now this second term, R is uh, RJ. My Y axis is up. The radius of this thing is r, is the radius. So the moment arm is rj crossed with the linear momentum of that piece of pipe, which is the mass of the pipe times x2 dot in the i direction. j cross i is minus k. so. I, Z, Z, respect to G, theta double dot, theta dot, I keep taking the derivative a little too soon, K minus R, M, X, 2, dot, K. And now sum of the torques, D by DT of H with respect to A, take the derivatives, I, Z, Z, G, theta double dot, K, minus r m x2 double dot k. Unfortunately, none of these unit vectors are rotating, so we don't have to deal with any of that. And I'm almost to the end, but now I have to go back to that original kinematic relationship, which allows me to express x2 in terms of x1 and r theta. And if I substitute that in here, and solve for it, I get theta double dot equals mr over 
I Z Z G plus M R squared. X double dot, whole thing. X one double dot. So you've accelerated x1 double dot. The thing starts rolling. In, and actually, it's rolling backwards, which is the plus theta direction at this rate. And we did this using this formula for HA. Now, the beauty of this formula is that it works for moving points A, points that are moving, even can be accelerating. All sorts of nasty conditions, it's true. It's based on the fundamental definition of angular momentum. So the book, yeah? The uh, final point here, I just want to make sure I understood. In this first line here, on the physical law, yeah. that uh, stroke doesn't mean that V sub A was zero. It meant that that term is zero. This term is zero that because is these happen to be parallel. The product, the product is zero in this case. If it had not turned out to be, they were different directions. That would be a non-zero term, and you would have to bring it along and take its derivative along with the other stuff. Okay. But this is a really powerful method. Now, I'm, the book is reasonably good in lots of points. But in chapter 17, when it do, does problems that are kind of like this, it, it, it introduces something. I, I, fi I find it hard to digest what they're doing. There's particularly, where's Matt? There's equation 17, 15. When you get to that bit of the book, just ignore it. Use this method. Okay? The author tries to give you kind of a little trick that you can use. But the problem with tricks is you have to memorize them. So what I've shown you today is on, based on basic definition of angular momentum. That expression at the top is always usable not just special little conditions, which is what is, it's, the formula in the book is generated for. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. Let, let you ask questions, and then I'll just pose a conceptual problem or two and ask you what method you'd use. Yeah. Oh, you know, boy, I'm glad you caught that. Yeah, in order to be able to do this, we've got to know, know something here, right? Important catch. Thank you. Why is this true? So we chose, that's why, we chose to work around point A. With respect to that point, there are no external forces that create moments on that pipe with respect to that point. And that's why you can say that the time derivative of this angular momentum is equal to zero, because there are no external torques. If you had picked any, if you'd picked G to do this problem, would the sum of the torques about G be zero? No, you'd have to put that friction force in there and have RF and figure out what F is. We completely avoided having to calculate the friction force. That's the point of being able to use techniques like this and can make your computations around points of contact. Okay. The, uh, so what, so the you know, textbooks have lots of problems like this. You've got a box on a sh cart and your kid's pushing it, and he gets a little exuberant and pushes a little too hard, accelerates the cart a little too fast, and the box falls over and breaks the lamp or whatever's in it, right? And if, you, if it's this way, and I accelerate it, it's much more tolerant. Falls over easier this way. But if I asked you, gave you a problem, and said, uh, calculate the maximum acceleration that I can put on this object such that it just barely, one, just right at the edge of tipping over, but doesn't tip it over. What's that maximum acceleration that you don't tip it over? What method would you use? One, I give you the three, three kind of four classes of approaches to problems.
She, I hear a four. Anybody else want to bid here? More fours. Would three work? Why? He says three would be complicated. Three means taking moments and forces with respect to the center of mass. If you do that, what do you have to deal with in this problem? You have to, you have to then, around the center of mass, there's a friction force. There's a normal force pushing up here. And the way you do this problem is you just where it's just barely about to go, all of the force is pushing on this corner. You just barely think of it, it's just you know, lifting up a fraction. You know, all of that contact point moves to right here. You have an upward force and a friction force, and they, they create a moment about G. But if you do the forces around G, you have to solve for those two. You do the forces around A. The trick here is figuring out where's A. But if you realize A is right here, and you do what we just did, this, this problem just piece of cake. 